Okay, so let's just uh, uh, talk about this problem of protein function prediction. And for this audience, probably uh, is super familiar what is a protein. The protein is a polypeptide chain. So it's a, it's a very long sequence on some alphabets. The building blocks are amino acids, and there are exactly 20 amino acids out there. Um, but proteins don't stay as a linear sequence, right? So they typically fold into some particular 3D structures. And because of the 3D structure that they have, and because of the interactions between the amino acids, they express some, some, some sort of functions. In this case, let's say they fluoresce. So the protein that I'm showing here is a pro protein called uh, GFP, green fluorescent protein. It has this uh, kind of interesting cylindrical structure, and there's some chromatin uh, inside it. And, and when you excite it at certain frequency, it starts to resonate, and then it, and then it can, uh, you know, uh, fluoresce back light at certain frequency, which is pretty close to uh, color green. So this protein was isolated from jellyfish something around 50 or 60 years ago. And because of that, uh, so the researchers got the Nobel Prize in It was a pretty, pretty big deal. So now, now the question that we have is that, you know, how can we go from the, uh, from the sequence information to the function? And of course, a GFP and fluorescence is just one of the functions that we are interested in. And there are many interesting functionalities of proteins that you can think about. So proteins that can catalyze our, our reaction. So if people are using enzymes and proteins to be able to recycle plastics, to be able to reduce the CO2 from the environment. Um, they are using proteins to be able to develop therapeutics and therapeutics application for CRISPR in order to also to uh, deliver drugs. So that we are using it as cargo. But what is shared among all these applications is that what we like to solve is a, is a big long lasting question in biology is that how can we map the functional properties of that protein to the sequence? How can you go from the amino acid sequence to, to the properties of that, that, that protein? So in this case, I'm going to take the green fluorescence protein as a model protein, and I'm going to take the fluorescence as a model function, but most of what I'm going to talk about here is going to generalize to other functionalities like binding, to other molecules, signaling, or anything that you can imagine. So let's try to put a map app on, on this problem. So let's assume that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this D many sites on this protein, right? And, and the question is, if I start changing the amino acid on this site, how is the property of that protein is going to change? Okay. So how am I going to encode that process? So we have uh, 20 amino acids. So for each of these sites, I can switch each of the amino acids to 19 other amino acids. Okay. And what I'm trying to find is the dysfunction F, right? which maps us from the space, this D-dimensional Hyman cube, uh, to a property in R. So think about R as being the brightness of that protein or the, let's say, wavelength that the protein is going to maximally fluoresce. So it's just a number. Okay. So the big challenge is how to estimate this F. And the problem is that we don't have lots of measurements of it. It's a high dimensional problem. We don't have lots of measurements. How can I solve that? So in order to make the problem a little bit easier, and I'm, I'm going to go back to the generalization, I'm going to assume that this, for now, the mutations are binary. In other words, for each of these sites, let's say X1, uh, let's say the original amino acid is A, instead of assuming that I can switch it to 19 other amino acids, I'm just going to consider one type of mutation. So let's say A to B at location one, Let's say if location two uh, for GFP was a P, I'm going just to consider mutation from P to S. I'm going to say how that, that will generalize to the larger case. Okay, so plus, yeah. Right, uh, so plus one at location I, meaning that I'm not changing the amino acid, it will be the wild type. Minus one is that I'm going to mutate it to some other amino acid of interest. Okay, okay. so XI will become binary. So in this case, F, in mathematics, it's called the pseudo Boolean function, right? It's a Boolean function because the inputs are binary. It's a pseudo Boolean because the output is not binary. The output is actually a real number. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, can you just uh, explain the, what the output uh, represents? That's right. So, so, yeah, so think about the output. So, when you typically work with biologists, they like they are working with certain proteins that have certain capabilities, and we want to maximize those. In the case of fluorescence, you want to fluoresce maximize the brightness of that protein, let's say, or you want to make the uh, spectrum sharper. So let's say that is the measure of sharpness of that spectrum. In the case of AAV, like David is working in dyno, you want to maximize the 
uh, the capacity of AAV virus to be able to encapsulate drugs. So it's just a number for now, but this, you can think about this number become a vector or something like that. But for mathematical principle, I can start simple. So some properties of that protein, or you can think about it as a COVID-19 solution. It might be the binding of some immuno, immuno cell to some other cell, so binding uh, property that you can measure in the experiment. Yes, definitely, yes, yeah. Okay, so something that you can assay, yeah. Okay, so this function f is called the pseudo Boolean function. Inputs are binary, it's coming, it's mapping from a binary hypercube to a real number. Okay, so everybody happy? Um, so, what do we know about pseudo Boolean functions in discrete mathematics is that any f, no matter how complex that is, it could be the function of any protein, can be written as a polynomial, right? And it's a particular pro polynomial, it's called a multilinear polynomial. Uh, as you can see, so the only the monomial looks like this x1, x1, x2. There is no exponent to it because if you want to take x1 to any power, then it becomes itself. So x1 to the power of an odd number becomes itself, even number becomes one. There is no need to add, add all of them. So, so if you look at this, this expression, you will see that there are some first order terms. Okay? Uh, there are some second order terms, some third order, and all the way to deep order. Okay? So I assume that everybody is familiar with this. So if you take the first d plus one terms in this expression, this looks like a site independent model. We are not assuming any sort of correlation here. We are assuming that these mutations are completely independent from each other, right? And this is something that we know of as a linear regression. So we fit a linear function. Uh, and sometimes we want to assume some levels of nonlinearity. So we add some pairwise interaction. This class of models are called pairwise models. So in the case of unsupervised learning, where this F is actually not the property of the protein, but actually the likelihood of that protein, if you want to do a density estimation, then you probably use something like POTS model, IC model, or second order graphical models that are popular in statistical physics that people have been using for years and years. And all they, what they are is that they are capturing the second order interaction between the amino acids. Okay. But in fact, this is just too simplistic. So in original F, if you think about any random binary, not random, but any structure, uh, complex function, this can have all these higher order interactions, third order, fourth order, and, and maybe higher. Okay, so, so now the question becomes how and why, uh, why in statistical physics and chemistry, we are not being able to handle this kind of polynomials which have all the higher order interactions. And the reasons comes from just looking at another way of looking at this expression, which is like a bunch of sums. So for it, uh, so if you look at D location, this is like sum from K1 to KD over zero and one and all the possible monomials. So if you start counting, you will see that the total number of unknowns, the number of alphas that you don't know in this equation is exactly two to the power D, right? So zero one zero one. So you, you assume that each of them active or, or not active. So so what eventually you see that the dimension of the problem is super large. So we have two to the power d many unknowns. How can I going to estimate that? And if you think about the original problem, if you think about the alphabet number of alphabets to be q. So for the case of amino acids, it's actually twenty. So this becomes twenty to the power d. But this is a it's a massively large number. So if you think about uh, so how uh, this number two to 20 to the power D is, just you can think about a moderate size protein, so something like 60. And let's say I'm, I'm interested to know what happens if I switch on and off uh, amino acid in all of these 60, lo 60 locations. And, and the dimension of the problem becomes something like 10 to the power 84, which is as large as the number of atoms in the universe. There's no way that we have as many proteins to be able to estimate. So first of all, it's a statistically hard problem because we cannot do this many number of experiments. We cannot make that assay that's large. Even if we can do that, if we create some crazy chat GPT that can uh, predict the value of protein, uh, property of protein, then how can I find these alphas? It would be a computationally challenging problem to going from these uh, measurements from the protein to alpha. How, how, how am I going to solve this problem? So it turns out that one tool, mathematical tool that is going to become very instrumental in order to understand this polynomial comes from Fourier, like, which is like hundreds of years ago. This has been developed for completely different purpose, but excitingly, this is actually being, uh, it is going to be super useful to be able to solve the problems that we have for protein science. And, and, and for people who have taken courses in signal processing or applied mathematics, just by looking at this polynomial, they realize that, huh, there seems to be that some Fourier kind of properties going on. Maybe it seems that I'm writing F, 
as the bunch of linear sums of some harmonics, right? And, and in fact, your guess is true. So these alphas, as you're going to see, are in fact the Fourier transform of the function alpha, okay? And, and I'm going to talk about it more, but there's also some interesting connection between the Fourier transform of this function f and, and a core concept in statistical genetics, which is called epistasis. So what the epistasis tells us is that if you're doing, if you have two mutations, so how much nonlinearity going on between these two mutations is going to call is going to be called epistasis. In other words, if you, if I have a protein and I'm mutating location A and look and mutating location two and seeing what is the output of this protein, what is the functional property of that protein, if these two pro, these two mutations are interacting linearly. Then we say that there is no epistatic interaction. There is no nonlinear interaction going on. This means that all the coefficients from x1, x2 to the right side are all zero. But most common in nature, whenever you are talking about two effects in body, let's say two genes interacting, two proteins interacting, or two mutations interacting, they interact in a nonlinear way. And the amount of nonlinearness of this can be captured using these alphas. Like if there is a nonlinear interaction between mutation one or mutation two, and this is this is directly uh, uh, related to the Fourier uh, transform of this function. So statistical geneticists know so how to find epistasis. They don't exactly use the terms that we use in signal processing, but that's that's exactly the type of calculation they do in order to find the level of epistasis. What is the direction of epistasis? What is the magnitude of epistasis? Okay, so let's just start from a simple example. Uh, let's assume that we have a function f, right, uh, which is giving us the property of a protein. I'm, I'm taking a GFP protein, and I am looking at four locations on the protein. I call them x1, x2, x2, and x4. I'm doing some binary mutation. And let's say I tell you that this property of that protein can be explained using this polynomial. I'm just going to convince you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a... Uh, some uh, some thought process to see how I can find this coefficient one one two one from the function evaluation there. How is that even possible? Okay, so since the total number of mutations is not large, it's only four. Something that I can do is that I can go to the lab, right, and I can create all the possible way that I can mutate that protein. Okay? So I can create a dictionary like this. So in the first row, I'm not mutating any of the location. This is actually the wild type. I'm going to predict the property, well, how much is going to that protein to fluoresce. Let's say that number is five. And then what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to only uh, mutate location X4. I'm not going to mutate the rest. Okay? This is going to be giving me another, and then I assay it. So this gives me some number one. I'm just going to do it for all these enumerations of four binary variables. There are 16, many of them. Maybe I can do something like CRISPR. I don't know, random PCR if I'm lucky. But then it's not probably going to be too expensive to get a measurement like this. Okay, so I'll, I'll get a vector down here which shows the properties of all these pro proteins as a result of creating all these massive uh, mutations. Okay. Um, uh, that's good. So now let's let's see, let's say what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take this vector y, which I'm going to call it a fitness landscape or fitness function, so called in, in biology, and I'm going to change the basins. I'm going to write this vector y as the sum of a column of a matrix, going to be a, a square matrix, which is called a wall chatamord or Fourier matrix. So if I do this change of bases, uh, what I'm essentially doing is that I'm writing this vector as a sum of a bunch of these columns. The weightings or the loading that I'm going to get in vector alpha, the entries is going to have a one-on-one -on -one correspondence to the uh, coefficients of this polynomial. Right, so there's one, one who corresponds to those two, and there's two corresponding to X1 and X2. Okay. So this matrix, you can think about it as a Fourier matrix. It has, it has all the harmonics. It's an orthonormal basis. Because it's an orthonormal basis, this H is invertible. In fact, it's orthonormal. The inverse of H is itself. Therefore, you can you know, take the inverse of H, which is itself, bring it to the other side of the equation, hit it by Y, and find alpha. So all the information that is here in Y is going to be in alpha and there is no there is not a lossy process so all the information in y is going to be in alpha so so what you can do if you and somebody if somebody has questions over zoom you can tell me you can stop me uh yeah i i missed the question i'm probably oh so so in this it's just a toy example 
So let's say somebody, for this story example, I know function f. I'm going to talk about how I'm going to recover it. So that's, that's just the purpose of the talk here. Okay, good. So yeah, thanks. Uh, so what I can do to find alphas, if I know why, so if I have the money and I can do 16 many experiments, so I can take H, find the inverse, hit it by Y and find alpha, I can find the polynomial. And in fact, so, so the, in terms of computational complexity, this will cause, uh, if the size of this, let's say, uh, matrix is P, P by P, doing this uh, product will be, uh, the computational complexity will be P squared. So you have to do P squared main calculation. You can do this a little bit faster. This is thanks to the fast Fourier algorithm. We know it now that using a divide and conquer algorithm, you can do this process slightly, not slightly, it's actually a bit here. It's not processing. You can go from P square to P log P, find alpha, if you can do all this Y calculation. So there are many studies in biology where people have been interested to find the epistatic interactions in few mutations on proteins, but the number of mutations in those studies is typically small. They have created this combinatorial space uh, because the space was so small, and then they have used the exact same process to find what is the epistatic interaction. But in fact, most common than not, uh, the number of mutations that we are interested to study is much larger than this, right? So in this case, P, which actually grows uh, exponentially with D, with the size of the protein, uh, it can become a really, really large number. So in that case, even order P log P times complexity will be too much. And on top of that, we can't do P many experiments. That's just too, too much to do. And, and the most of this talk is going to be talking about how can we handle these high dimensional problems if we have only few amount of experiments. Okay, so, so the key insight in, in sol solving this dilemma comes from some of the studies that we have done, and I'm going to point to some, one of them, is, is a paper by Ranganathan Lab, now at, and now at UChicago in Nature Communication, where they look at two variants of the fluorescent protein, one of them fluorescing light in color blue, and the other one fluorescing light in color red, okay? So these two proteins are exactly different at 13 location, 13 sites. What they have done is that they have created this interesting assay of all the two to the power 13 many ways 13 proteins that connect this protein on the left to the protein on the right. Uh, they have experimentally tested and see what is the, some measure of brightness in all those proteins. So the plot that I'm showing is X axis on all, all of these proteins sorted. Y is the brightness of those proteins. So we took this study and then exactly like I described, look at the walsh shadowmore transform or the Fourier coefficients of, of these of this, uh, 13 uh, mutations. And what we saw that some striking thing happened. So <clears throat> first of all, you can show the Fourier transform as this function f. So each of these coefficients are going to be corresponding to this spectrum peak of the spectrum. And, and one of the key observations here is that, maybe not surprisingly to people who are in communication and signal processing, this spectrum is not dense, okay? It's highly sparse, meaning that not all the interactions are going to be instrumental in predicting that functional property of that protein. And something that we know from, let's say, signal processing, the, the property of a white Gaussian noise is that if you take, look at them in the Fourier transform, this is going to be completely flat. If, if the signal has all the high frequency and low frequency component, that's probably, uh, there's no, no signal in it. Yes. Hi, um, a quick question about the WH basis. Does it incorporate spatial proximity between residues? Right, so, so this, this model, no. So we assume that there are some locations, uh, you could incorporate the 3D structure to help to have a better inference over those polynomials. But even just um, the 1D structure, does it in incorporate that, you know, X1 and X2 are proximal? Uh, exactly. We are not, as, we are assuming as a set. Yeah, just a set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and we, in fact, like that we are assuming to be a, a set. Uh, the reason is that, so if you have a really long sequence, uh, the location on the protein doesn't going to tell you anything about the interaction because the protein folds. And there could be a really, really long-term interaction that happening between two residues because in the 3D geometry, they're all close to each other. But there are ways that you can incorporate the 3D structure of a protein into these polynomials and make the inference better. I'm going to talk about it. Actually, David is going to talk about it. Yeah. But, uh, that, I, I guess, on the other hand, you would imagine that, um, you know, proxim like very proximal yeah. locations uh, have related. Perhaps, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, 
there are so so we are talking about the like bare bone math of this problem, mm -hmm. but yes, so there could be that if you are looking at residues that are close to each other, they're perhaps interacting. Uh, in fact, in this case, if you are taking these two residues, uh, they are interacting more, but then if you take this one and this one, they're probably not interacting. So these, this part is the chromatin part of the protein. So the selection of the location to mutate is something that comes from the biological knowledge. You should be kind of smart about that. I guess, yeah, I, the reason I ask is because if you look at the protein brightness, there's clear like spatial correlation like in, in these domains. Right. Yeah. So, so that, that's exactly true. Other than a sparsity, there are some other structure. For example, the fact that you can see X5 here might give you some uh, information that maybe with higher likelihood, you'll see a polynomial like X5 times X10. So there should be a hierarchical structure. I'm going to talk, talk about that. But, but the interesting thing is that something like neural network also has this hierarchical structure, as you know. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks. Kind of related to Salil's question, but what's the breakdown in terms of like um, one body, two body, three body terms, like are most of these, I forget what they're called, like alphas or weights, is most of the weight on the one body and the two body terms? And then the other question kind of related to Salil's is for the three body terms. Um, do you have like a physical interpretation? Because, it, you know, like most of the time when we're kind of learning about proteins and the physics of it, everything's like one or pairwise terms because of that's kind of how classical mechanics works. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. three body terms, it's usually like, something in the environment yeah. has changed and that changes the context of these two. But do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so yeah, the question is, is there any physical meaning behind these uh, third order terms? Um, it could be. So I, I, there is, we haven't done any experimental study to verify that is there in fact any three order interaction? Is there any physical reason? But something that we know is that I think the reason that statistical physics now is losing to something like variational autoencoder or transformer is that those models are comprehensive enough in such a way that they can accommodate some higher order interaction. It's a good question to ask that are they causal, but they are certainly predictive. And the reason that something like VAE is uh, outperforming something like a second order POTS model is probably the presence of those higher order interaction and some inductive biases. Are they physical? This is something I, my group thinks about every day. Can we, can we say something more about those? Can we convince ourselves that, in fact, uh, these are not because of some uh, like measurement noise or some nonlinearity is caused by some other non-physical process? Great question. OK. OK. OK, good. Great. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to repeat the other part of the question because I wanted to know the answer, too. Uh, empirically, what kind of drop off do you see as you go from first to second to third and higher order terms uh, in, in the experimental examples you've looked at? Right. So, so this is one, one of the largest examples in the literature that actually they are looking at a combinatorial space of 13 mutations. They are very rare because they're very expensive and hard to do. Uh, but typically, there is some sort of uh, maybe power law where you mostly see second, first order, second order, there are third order. But then if you go down the line to something like 10 order, 10 order effect, it, it's effectively noise. There is not, not much energy down there. But third order and fourth order, you can easily see uh, that, that there are coefficients active there. Great, that bodes well for inference, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so good. So, so we have sparsity. Uh, definitely there. And it seems to be that this sparsity should help us statistically and computationally. Uh, if this spectrum was completely dense, you might think that you need more, more amount of information to learn it. But if it is, if it is sparse, there's only few non-zeros, probably I should be able to do something smart algorithmically to be able to use that sparsity in some way. And in fact, there are results uh, that in, in, in signal processing that shows that that is in fact true in the sense that if you have a p-dimensional fitness landscape two to the power d, in this case, I'm looking at binary mutation. If you assume that, now this is a mathematical assumption, that the, uh, the fitness landscape is exactly k sparse, okay, then you can recover that fitness landscape. You can find all the values of the proteins in that landscape using only k log p many number of measurements instead of p many measurements that you, you, you might need using something like fast Fourier transform. And this one is not super uh, new or surprising. This is coming from this literature of compressed sensing. 
uh, where we know if, if a signal has some structure in some other basis, like a sparsity in an orthonormal, orthonormal basis, then you will uh, get a log uh, 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 kind of advantage over that. But the striking is something that you will see that finding those nonlinear coefficients can also be super fast. This is a kind of a new result in the sense that you can find the landscape, the entire landscape, in a time also that grows logarithmically. So it's not only sample efficient, but also time efficient. This goes from p log p of FFT to k log p. Yes. Is k the uh, the number of um, non-zero frequency peaks? Or what, That's what, right. what is yeah. K? yeah. Uh, value number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So if p is like two to the power hundred, so you're looking at hundred location, but you know that only a million of interactions are going to be active, you don't need to take uh, two to the power hundred many measurements. So you just need something around a million. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense from information theory wise, but this is a purely computational algorithm. So I'm going to talk about how we can achieve this. And by the way, so this can be, uh, the, the algorithm is robust to noise. So it does, you, you, the Walsh and transfer doesn't need to be exactly k sparse. It can have some additive Gaussian noise due to inst instrumental measurement. Yes. Um, in the case of uh, where only second order terms, anything more than second order is non zero, yep. what is the k? Yeah. yeah. Good. So, okay, that, that's great. So here, the underlying assumption is that the Fourier coefficient should be drawn randomly in a sense that with the same likelihood, you're drawing something like a 10th order of uh, interaction versus first order. In the last few slides, I'm going to talk about the case where you assume it's actually low order and how this results. Uh, short answer is that you're going to get another log advantage here if you know that actually uh, you're looking at something up to, let's say, sixth order interaction. Okay. Okay. Good. So, what what is the uh, what is the secret sauce? Uh, so, let's assume that we have in this case sixteen unknown interactions that I'd like to find. In this case, four of them are non-zero; they are active. Uh, in a in a real problem, this is massively high-dimensional, and the problem becomes like a, a finding the location of these red dots. Right? And the way you do it is like a divide and conquer process. I'm going to group these interactions somehow intelligently in a way that, so this bucket is going to be taking the linear sum of the interactions of the first group, second one linear interactions on the second group all the way. And if that's the case, then I can easily eliminate part of the search space, large search space, that there is no interaction. So in this case, uh, if there is all zero here, I can, if I get a zero down here, I can easily eliminate that. And in some cases I'm lucky and there's only one nonlinear interaction, I can easily infer based on the value of that I'm getting here, what is the location and what is the value. In some cases, I'm unlucky. There are two of them in the same bucket, so I need to resolve that case. <laughs> but the, the idea of uh, solving this uh, comes from something called aliasing and signal processing. Has anybody heard about aliasing? Okay, that's good. So, so, so if you're taking, if you just go back to old days of photography, so forget about iPhone. Right. So let, let's say we have a really old, uh, uh, actually, camera, and then you are taking a photo of some surface like here, which has really high frequency components okay, because of these bricks. Right. So if you if you if your camera is really low red, it's going to uh, going to undersample your image, and because of the undersampling, not only your image is going to be blurry, but it's actually going to add some frequency to your image. Something like this, right? And the reason that's happening is that the spectrum of the image, because of this high frequency component, has some tail. And as you're doing undersampling, you're effectively squishing this spectrum to as far as each other. And there will be some aliasing happens here. And that's a result, the result of seeing this kind of Moire effect. So the same thing happens if you are looking at a fitness landscape, right? And you're undersampling it because of evolution or because of you don't have. You know, your assay cannot sample all this space of mutations. So your frequency component, this rugged land landscape is going to have some sort of representation in the Fourier domain. As you're undersampling it, those rugged, those Fourier coefficients are going to be kind of squished, squished towards each other. Okay. So that is bad. So aliasing, if you talk about through any signal processing, they'll tell you it's a bad effect. There are, in fact, the aliasing algorithms out there. What we like, what we like to do is that we like to come up with some sort of undersampling that actually leverage aliasing for our purpose rather than avoiding. Okay, so so aliasing in this case is something good. We are going to use it. 
So how am I going to use it? Let's try to go back to our linear system. So what I'm going to do in order to leverage this aliasing is this. So I'm, I'm going to come up with a very clever way of undersampling. Instead of like a camera, I'm going to be more clever. So uh, I, I cannot afford to take 16 many measurements. That's two to the power D. That's really large. I'm going to sample it in this particular way. So I'm going to fix the mutation at location X3 and X4. I'm not going to mutate them at all. I'm going to focus on these four rows. I'm going to change the mutation at X1 and X2. One, one, one minus one, minus one, one, minus one, one, one. It turns out that this is something that I'm allowed to do because so I can uh, keep the number of mutations so small that uh, it's a computationally feasible task. Okay? So these four rows will correspond to these four rows in my linear system. Okay? First row, fifth row, and all the way. Okay? So, so let's say I'm taking this measurement. I will get rid of the rest of the rows. So the linear system will look like this. Okay? Now we have a problem, right? So we have four equations, but we have 16 many unknown. So it's a, the inverse problem that I should not be able to solve in, in practice in general, but there is hope to solve this problem only because these coefficients are actually sparse. Okay? So, and the way I would solve this is this. I'm going to use another interesting property from signal processing, which tells us that if you take a signal and then if you undersample it, and then instead of doing some big Fourier transform, do some small Fourier transform. Then there will be some interesting aliasing effect. So this is what I'm going to do. So I have already undersampled this linear system. I'm going to take a small Fourier transform. Realize that this is a four by four instead of a 16 by 16. In a larger scale it will be instead of P by P, this will be a log P by log P Fourier transform. This is something that I'm allowed to do. Okay, so I'm going to hit both sides of the equation by this is small Fourier transform I can afford to do. So this will be some other numbers here, but the exciting happens when I hit this matrix by this undersample, clever undersampling. And right after that, when you hit that small Fourier transform, you will see that there will be lots of zeros in this matrix. You love it because we can do fast processing. Okay, let's see how that works. So the first elements here now is actually taking linear measurements of the first four elements, first four, first four Fourier coefficients, and the rest of them is zero. Second element in my this transform measurement is taking linear measurement of the second set of four, and then the rest is zero. Okay, so it just shout, 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 uh, shouts out that we can actually write this linear system as a graph, right? Where the first element two is taking a linear measurement of the first uh, first four Fourier coefficients that I don't have. These are kind of hidden. I, I'm not telling you what those are. So this uh, second one one is taking linear measurement from this, this, and uh, so on and so forth. And the problem of finding the Peters nanoscape becomes the problem of finding the location of red dots after only observing these four numbers and knowing this graph. Okay. okay, so the trick was doing undersampling, doing some small Fourier, casting the problem into a graph, and then solve it. So it turns out that four many measurement is not going to be enough to be able to fully resolve this graph. Eight is enough. So I'm going to take another set of four. Now we know the trick. So I'm going to this time fix X1 and X2, right? I'm not going to mutate these two location of the protein. I'm going to mutate these two location, take five measurements, okay? So this will correspond to these five rows. I'll get rid of the rest, take a small Fourier transform, hit it by both sides, and you will see that again, another interesting sampling pattern will arrive, where the first element is taking measurements of every fifth coefficient. Okay, so that's why number two is connected to one, five, uh, nine, and all the way down. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to put these two sets of measurements into the same graph. This was the first set of measurements. This is the second set of measurements. They are taking some linear measurements from my Fourier coefficients, and the question becomes a balls and bins problem. I am observing eight numbers. I know this graph. I don't know the location of non-zeros. How can I find a non-zero location? It turns out that this is very close to an algorithm that we know from coding theory, the decoding algorithm. We use it to communicate bits at the time of Shannon and, and it goes back to Gallagher is here. So the way it works is that you will cluster the nodes down here into three groups called zero tons, single tons, and multi tons. 
Um, zero tons are the ones like this. They are not connected to any nodes up there. Uh, uh, single tons are the ones like this that is connected to one node. And multi-tons are like this that are connected to two nodes. Multi-tons are problematic because if there is two, two nodes that I don't know which of them uh, are connected to this, then I need to resolve, uh, kind of deconvolute the effect of these two. But single tons are really like them. Why? Because if I know this is a single ton, and if I know that this is connected to this node, then I can fully resolve that. I can, I can assign this number one to this coefficient x2, x3, and x4, right? And just remove the effect of one from this graph. How do I remove it? So let's say, let's start from this example. So there's a single ton here, two, two. I'm going to just delete this. This will become uh, zero. I remove the uh, effect of this two from the graph, and I keep my recovered interaction, which was x1 times x2 in my back. So I continue the same process. Uh, identify the nodes that are singleton, uh, uh, multitons, uh, get, uh, peel off the uh, effect of the singleton. And as, as, I, as I peel off more of the singleton, something like this, which was a multiton, actually becomes a singleton. And then you can get rid of the uh, effect of those from the graph as well. So all in all, you will see that by a bunch of peeling processes, it's kind of, kind of, the algorithm is called peeling decoding. It is something that is out there from coding theory. It's nothing that we invented. Uh, you will be able to find the Fourier coefficients or the fitness landscape of the protein function. Turns out there are some theoretical works that goes back to density evolution, dupe particle argument that you can prove that in fact, if you have enough number of measurements, enough number of labeled proteins, you can find these epistatic interactions and the graph will be resolved uh, through something like this. Okay, sounds good. Let's just take a, take a quick look at time. Uh, okay, so, so I'm gonna wrap up soon. So, so okay, this is good, so this is the algorithm, but let's, I, I, I uh, didn't talk about some important part, which was I, everything here was about binary mutation, absence or presence. It turns out that everything can be extended to the case where XIs are not just binary, but all the mutations. And, and the fix is pretty easy. So instead of uh, taking xi to be plus and minus one, you take xi to be the q roots, uh, roots of the unity. So you'll take the unity, you divide it, you divide it into this uh, complex numbers. So xi becomes some complex, complex numbers. You go from Fourier to the generalized Fourier and everything else just holds it exactly the same. So your polynomial will be not only, a, a, not a multilinear polynomial anymore, but actually it looks, looks like something like this. So you will see that some exponents here, which are taking care of the effect of amino acids at that side. So the good thing about this generalized Fourier is that you can not only infer the interaction between two sites in a protein, but also you can say what is the interaction of this particular amino acid at that side with this other amino acid at this other side. Okay. Um, so, so is this the, effectively is this effectively just the the standard discrete Fourier transform, and then and then a product of that over all the sites? So this is so this is a generalized discrete Fourier transform in a sense that this leaves okay it's a good slide so this is a, a, a kind of a d-dimensional Fourier transform you're taking a Fourier transform but you're expanding it in d-dimension that's become a generalized form of Fourier transform but but yes it, it inherits it, it uh, inherits all the interesting properties that a Fourier transform has. Oh, so okay, so the structure is that it's it's the the classical discrete transform at each site, and then it's a direct product or a tensor product over the that's sites. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So in this case, your your Hadamard matrix, instead of being two to the power d by two to the power d, becomes q to the power d is q to the power d. Uh, but it has all the properties. It's still orthonormal. It's still square. It has all the information. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's orthonormal. You can find the inverse, and the inverse becomes itself. Okay, sounds good. And, and, and what we showed in this very recent paper that you can develop an algorithm called QSFT, which will be the generalized version of the binary algorithm. So the bounds are pretty similar. So you can find this fitness landscape that lives in Q to the power D dimensional space uh, using this QRA. If, the, if you assume that the QRA Fourier transform is K sparse using number of label protein that grows with K log P again, uh, where the, uh, the base is Q in this case, and the time complexity is again log, log Q. That the trick is exactly the same, bucketing this higher order interaction. So realize that in this case, we have some expression like this X2 to the power two to the power three. These are taking into account the type of the amino acid at each of those sites. 
And these are not only in the interaction between two locations, but also gives you some sense of interaction of one type of amino acid at those two locations. Okay, uh, so sounds good. And, and, and the last note is that the same property for so if you subsample your Fourier, the general Fourier, and then you take this small Fourier transform, you can still make it into a graph processing algorithm, and you can do all fun stuff. So the last note that we talked about is not all the interactions are are equal, right? So if you think about the real problem, the probability that you get a six order interaction, it's much, it's much, much smaller than getting something like a pairwise interaction. interaction. So how can we use this property, not only uh, sparseness, but actually this low or low degreeness of this polynomial in order to improve our algorithm. So the way you would do it is that you will do exactly the same process. You construct your graph, but you construct your graph in a way that is taking samples from the low orders already, but is actually ignoring, let's say, something like a tenth order degree. And you can you can in fact do it using some coding theory tricks. And the trick is this: so when you are finding what is this location, this this check node is connected to. So you will see that there are two types of sparsity going on. Not only the interactions are sparse, but actually the index of these interactions is sparse, right? So in this case, one, three, and four are active, one, three, and four are active, and many of them are unactive. For each of the sparsity, you will get one log advantage. So you get one log P because the coefficients are sparse. You get another log advantage because the index of those coefficients is sparse. It's gonna two sparse recovery at the same time, okay? So in that case, your time and sample cost become k log log p. So if you think about p being q to the power d, this becomes d becomes length of the protein. So you need to take something along log d amount of measurements uh, in total, and then that just keeps it up. And of course, there is some constant here. So in practice, you will need to be able to uh, take enough measurements that suits for your practical application. So I, I didn't want to talk anything about the result. I guess Dave, David will talk about the practical result, but just just some, some simulation that we did. Uh, so we took an RNA uh, and then we tried to predict the mean free energy of this RNA and looking at like uh, 18 locations that you can mutate that. So we use the ND simulator for as a thermodynamic model, which takes some time to find this mean free energy. So in total, the dimension of the problem is four to the power 18, 10 to the power 10. But we show that we only need something around a million measurements in order to completely recover, not run the ND, ND simulation at all, and trying to predict what would be the value of this mean free energy. And, and, and here you can see how the co time complexity of the algorithm grows uh, with, with, this, uh, with the size. It's essentially, because of this log log V effect, it doesn't have a, a really, uh, yeah, it's not a function of essentially the protein size, pretty, pretty fast compared to something like lasso, which is a sparsely complex solver. Okay, sounds good. So with this, uh, these are just some take home. Uh, so if you have a fit of landscape, a Fourier or wall shadow is an interesting tool, uh, maybe something that is underappreciated. I think it's going to be very, very useful for the problems that we care in, in protein design and protein fit of landscape prediction. Uh, we saw that protein fit of landscape is not random, it's highly structured. And this is structure manifests as this sparse, sparse polynomials. And we saw that the sparsity can be used for sample and efficient inference, but there's a catch, right? So you need to be able to suggest samples. You need to be able to design protein. It doesn't work if you just randomly uh, propagate, do something like random PCR and create some random patterns of mutation and you expect that you get the same computational advantage. You will get the uh, statistical advantage. You will be able to that is to be find the coefficient, but you won't get the computational advantage if you don't uh, if you don't get labels from those specific clever, clever way of subsampling that uh, get around the aliasing. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, I am currently a machine learning research scientist at Dino. Uh, before that, I was at Berkeley where I met Amirali, and he introduced me to the wonderful world of the walsh hadamard transform, uh, which guided a lot of my research since then. And I'm going to be talking about a few of the different ways that, that we've used this. Um, and just as a disclaimer, most of this work was done at, at Berkeley and, and not at Dino, and I'll touch on a small amount of work uh, that we just released from Dino. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about three research arcs here, uh, all focused around this idea that we can use the walsh hadamard transform or the Fourier transform 
uh, to understand how the process of learning fitness functions can be improved uh, or just um, how, how we can understand fitness functions uh, a little bit better. And so the first one is, a, is from a paper uh, that Amarali and I worked on a couple of years ago. And the main focus of this is using the walsh hadamard transform to try to understand something about experimental design. So how many measurements do we need to learn a fitness function? And so just to briefly recap, of course, Amarelli has covered a lot of this, uh, but the motivation for this comes from uh, the fact that machine learning models in uh, recent years have become a very powerful tool for uh, designing protein sequences. So you train a model, and then you want to use that model to search around sequence space and find proteins or uh, other biological sequences that improve their function. And so when I worked on this in the past, uh, in a completely different context, more of a machine, pure machine learning context, I got asked this question many times. How many sequences do I need to measure experimentally in order to learn my function? How many sequences as an experimentalist do I need to give you uh, in order to perform uh, your design methods? And I generally didn't have an answer for it. But the reason for asking this question is, is of course, clear. Uh, there are many different experimental techniques out there for assaying the fitness of, of proteins and biological sequences at different levels of fidelity. Uh, so here I'm just showing the rough scales of uh, different, different types of methods, uh, low throughput, uh, chemical methods, medium throughput, and high throughput uh, NGS driven methods. And so uh, all of these have different uh, levels of uh, noise in them. And of course, an experimenter would want to know how many sequences they need to measure before choosing and designing such an experiment. And so in order to approach this problem, the core concept that we had to uh, nail down was this concept of a sequence space. And it's something that in the past, when I, was, when I had uh, worked on training machine learning models on fitness data, it was something I never really uh, considered concretely or sort of a vague notion of what sequences I wanted to make predictions on. Uh, but I didn't nail it down exactly what this space was. And the first step of this, this project was really to do that. And so what do I mean by a sequence space? I think there's really two, two types of sequence spaces that we generally encounter in protein engineering. One of them is, is an edit distance ball, which is you have a wild type sequence, and then you want to make predictions of the fitness of all sequences up to, say, D mutations away from that. Um, and then there's this other type of space, which is the combinatorially complete sequence space, which is you have uh, length L sequences uh, of an alphabet size Q, and you want all combinations of those sequences. So these are the two most common types of sequence spaces that we encounter. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this was just to make clear that we are mostly uh, going to be talking about combinatorially complete sequence spaces, because this is where the walsh hadamard transform and the Fourier transform are, are, are useful. So back to our, our main goal, uh, uh, in this combinatorially complete sequence space, we wanna know how many measurements do we need to take experimentally in order to learn a good fitness function uh, for different settings of the sequence length and alphabet size Q. And the main purpose of this again is to, to answer the question, how can I design my experiments such that I can expect to learn a good fitness function. And one of, besides choosing the uh, experimental method, like I talked about before, the ways that you can modify your experiment is by limiting the number of positions that are mutated in the experiment by changing the length or limiting the number of possibilities of each position, changing the alphabet. So how might you go about doing this? Uh, of course, to, to choose the positions that you want to modify, you can use structural or physical knowledge of important regions in a protein. Uh, so here I'm just showing a picture of uh, one of my favorite proteins, the adeno-associated virus. And uh, so there are a couple of important regions, the three and five-fold axis of symmetry are highlighted, and we know these are functionally important. So you can limit your modifications to, to those regions. If you want to limit the number of possibilities of each position, you can use evolutionary data, for instance, to uh, instead of considering every amino acid in, 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 uh, at every position of protein, you can only consider those which have been observed in evolutionary data and uh, are more likely to be functional. Of course, if you have the means, you can also do both of these with, say, a saturation mutagenesis experiment where you calculate the fitness of every possible single mutation to a sequence and use that to modify your experiment. 
So this is just motivation for how we might use the tools that I want to develop uh, in order to answer this question of how many measurements do we need. So now moving on to, to the more uh, mathematical part of the, of the problem. Uh, first, to approach this problem, we, we took a Fourier transform perspective on estimating fitness functions, which Amarelli has already talked about on length. Um, I apologize for changing the notation a little bit, but uh, here to start, we just represent this, uh, any fitness function as a uh, linear function, where you have the vector of all fitness values, F, and that is equal to the Fourier basis, the Q to the L times Q to the L matrix. And uh, that is multiplied by the vector of Fourier coefficients, uh, which I'll interchangeably call epistatic interaction. And so the, the estimation problem in this context becomes that you want to estimate the Fourier coefficients given a set of rows of the Fourier basis, which represents sequences and the corresponding elements of F perhaps corrupted by noise. And these are the observed fitness values. And so Amarali talked about a number of ways to, to actually solve this estimation problem, uh, particularly for uh, Q greater than two. Uh, that work was done after we did this work. And in this, in this work, we used the lasso, which is uh, a more familiar uh, method from machine learning, uh, but it has similar properties. And it just solves a, a, a simple optimization problem like this. And so the reason that we use methods like lasso or some of the methods that Amarelli talked about is that there's this remarkable result from compressed sensing, which is that if uh, those Fourier coefficients only contain S non-zero elements, or in other words, they're S sparse, then there's theoretical results that show that you need uh, n measurements where n is greater than a constant times the sparsity uh, times the logarithm of the total size of the sequence space in order to estimate those Fourier coefficients perfectly if they're noiseless measurements. And so if you look at this expression, uh, it becomes clear that there's only one unknown. C is a constant, which we can estimate numerically, and I'll talk about it a bit later, uh, but Q and L are parameters of our experiment and they're known. So the only thing that we would need to answer in order to understand how many measurements we need to take is what the sparsity of the fitness functions is. So now we've changed our problem slightly. Instead of asking the question, how many measurements do I need? We can just ask, what is the sparsity of fitness functions? And we'll be able to, to nail down how many measurements. We need. So the next big step in this project uh, was understanding actually how are we going to understand the sparsity of, of fitness functions? Um, and one, one big problem is that there aren't many complete empirical fitness landscapes out there. There are a handful of them uh, for a select number of settings of L and Q, and it would be very difficult to just take analogies of those in order to infer uh, for other uh, use cases. So we needed a more general tool for understanding this. So what we turn to is a, is a common paradigm in theoretical evolutionary biology, which is to use random field models, which are essentially probability distributions over fitness functions from which you can sample simulated fitness functions. And so this is just an image of, of a, you know, a cartoon of, of a random field and, and how you're sampling uh, fitness values from those. And so the, the general framework that we used for this project is that we took a random field model, uh, we sampled simulated fitness functions from it, and we determined the sparsity of those simulated fitness functions and then use the theory of compressed sensing to determine the number of training samples that you need to recover those, those simulated fitness functions. But then to map this back to uh, the real case of protein engineering, we tried to uh, compare whether these predictions of the, in the simulated fitness functions could be predictive of the sparsity of uh, empirical fitness functions. Uh, so we, we looked at one particular random field model. It's known as the generalized NK model. It's a slight generalization of the very well-known NK model. Uh, it's defined by three basic parameters. There is uh, the length, the alphabet size, and then the new parameter are, are what are called neighborhoods. Uh, and these are assigned to each position uh, in the sequence. So this is just showing an example set of neighborhoods uh, for a length nine sequence, uh, each uh, in blue, 
uh, show the neighborhoods for each position. And they essentially what the neighborhood specify is just which positions J interacts with. And so these are how you can control the specific properties of the simulated fitness function is by modifying the neighborhoods. Uh, and another important parameter, uh, which is where the K comes from in the name of the model is the size of the neighborhood. So uh, when K, when the size of the neighborhood is constant, it's just called K. Uh, in this case, K equals three. Uh, and this is, K determines the maximum order of epistatic interactions in the fitness function. Is, doesn't the K um, also then restrict the sparsity? Yes, the K restricts the sparsity as we'll see. But you can modify K in order to change the properties of the model. Why is this random field model a good sub in for a protein? Uh, that's a great question. And I will show some results later that will try to convince you that it is. Um, but one amazing property of the GNK models is that we can solve for the sparsity of these models of, uh, of fitness functions that are sampled from the GNK model uh, exactly uh, with this fairly simple expression that just sums over all subsets of the neighborhood, uh, all subsets of all of the neighborhoods. And so there isn't much to take from this expression uh, for this talk, except that it's quite easy to solve given any set of, uh, given L, Q, and the set of neighborhoods. And so this expression also allows us to derive a number of other expressions uh, for different, for specific neighborhood uh, settings. Uh, so in this case, one of the ones that we use most frequently uh, is a bound on the sparsity of any fitness function sample from the GNK model where all of the neighborhoods are of size K. And so I'll use this, this expression quite frequently. Again, there, there's nothing specific to take from it except that it's, it's just a simple closed form expression. Um, so now that we've determined the sparsity of the GNK fitness functions, we can back out and, and ask again, what are the number of measurements that we need to estimate GNK fitness functions? Uh, so we go back to this, this expression from, from compressed sensing, uh, which is the constant times the sparsity times the log of the size of the space. Uh, and so one part of this project was actually to uh, do some simple numerical experiments to show that uh, uh, if we set the constant to 2.5 in this case, in all of the in all of the tests that we did, we found that this was a sufficient to satisfy this bound. Uh, and so all we need to do to determine the number of measurements in order to re recover GNK fitness functions is to plug this, say, in one case, plug this bound that we had earlier, and this tells us the measurements that we need to recover any GNK fitness function uh, with. Uh, L, Q, and K parameters. And so this allows us to plot scaling laws for, for how many measurements are required to recover these G and K fitness functions. Uh, so in this case, we'll keep Q fixed, the size of the alphabet. So these are binary sequences, uh, which you can think about as being, uh, say, protein sequences where the actual alphabet is just whether or not you mutated a position. Um, and then as a function of L and K, we can plot the number of measurements required. Uh, to recover these. And so there are a number of intuitive uh, aspects of this. Uh, for instance, as you increase K, so you increase the maximum order of epistatic interactions, the number of measurements required to recover, of course, goes up. Um, and of course, as you increase L, the size of the, uh, the size of the length of the sequence, the number of measurements will go up. Um, and you can do the same thing by keeping L fixed. In this case, we'll just set it to 20. Uh, and then look at how uh, the size of the alphabet actually changes the number of measurements that are required. Are these chosen measurements or random, randomly sampled measurements across possible fitness? Great question. I should have mentioned these are uniformly randomly sampled, and this is a bound with high probability. It's not a bound with any. Uh, you can't choose just any random or any. So we, we have now have these scaling laws for G and K fitness functions, but of course it's a good question to ask is, does that matter at all? Um, and so then what we wanted to look at doing was uh, connecting this back to the few known empirical fitness functions that are out there and seeing whether we can modify the parameters of the G and K model to be predictive of the sparsity of 
empirical fitness functions. And the key tool that we're going to use to do that is to set these neighborhoods in the GNK model based on 3D structural contacts from crystal structures. And so Amirali talked about this, this wonderful data set uh, from the Ranganathan group uh, about the tag BFP uh, fluorescent protein. So here's an image of its crystal structure with all of the positions that were modified in the fitness function in the experimental data set highlighted. And so the way that we constructed neighborhoods for this is we just chose every uh, two, a position is in another position's neighborhood if at least one atom in each of those residues is less than 4.5 angstroms. And this is a, a, common, uh, a common value used for this cutoff distance uh, uh, that we've seen in other work. So what you end up with here is what looks like a, a structural contact map, symmetric set of neighborhoods. Uh, and so one amazing thing about this data set is that it's complete. It has all two to the 13 possible uh, measurements in it. And so you can calculate the exact walsh hadamard coefficients for this, uh, which I have plotted uh, the magnitude of here uh, with the uh, different orders of interaction separated by a dotted line. So these are first order interactions, second order, third order, fourth order, and so on. Uh, there are some sm very small values above fifth order, but they're, they wouldn't be uh, viewable in this plot. So then what we did was we, we looked at the coefficients that would result from this G and K model with structural neighborhoods. So now I'm showing the, the, the magnitude of the G and K coefficients on the, in red on the underside of the plot. And so what's, what's somewhat striking about this is that the G and K model with the structural neighborhoods is actually pretty predictive of the exact coefficients uh, that are, that are uh, significantly non-zero in the in the empirical data set. And what's really surprising about this is that uh, this goes up to, to fairly high order interactions that are observed in the data, including one fifth order interaction, as well as a number of fourth order interactions. And so this is just a qualitative comparison, but it's quite exciting. It gives us a sense that perhaps these GNK models with, uh, with structural neighborhoods are, are power, are, can predict the sparsity of, of empirical fitness functions. So to make that a little bit more quantitative and concrete, we, we calculated the percent variance explained by the largest coefficients in each of the G and K fitness functions and the uh, observed empirical fitness function. So in the G and K model, uh, the G and K model is 56 sparse. And in the empirical, uh, in the empirical fitness function, the top 56 coefficients explain 97% of the variance. And we can see that these curves are relatively similar, uh, which gives us more hope that the GNK model is, is relatively predictive of the sparsity of uh, empirical, the empirical fitness function. Um, a quick question about, I guess you could permute the, la like the labels for the, um, for the residues um, and get a different, um, like, the G, uh, different uh, spectrum. Um, this is this is like exact equivalence of the like it's the same, like the exact same coefficient in the G and K model as in the. Is that sorry? Does that kind of? I think uh, I understand. Yeah. So the uh, what we showed in the here is that the exact coefficients match, uh, or well, they. They roughly are, are matching. Um, but that actually, I think your intuition is right. That actually doesn't matter for this plot. This would be the same if we had completely different coefficients. Uh, so I think there are two kind of separate pieces of evidence that these are this is a decently good model. And there, there may be other ways that we can leverage the fact that it's a better model than just predicting the sparse. Right. Uh, so the next step of this of this process was to confirm that we could predict the number of measurements fairly well using the G and K model with structural neighborhoods. We wanted to ask you know, what started this, which is, can we predict the number of measurements that are required in order to recover a fitness function? And so what we did was we, we fit using lasso, we fit models to, to the empirical data, uh, 50 uh, random samples and uh, using the rest of the 
using the rest of the data as a test set um, and uh, varying numbers of training samples. Uh, and then we calculated the R squared on the test set. And so the GNK model and the compressed sensing theory predict that we need 548 samples to, to exactly recover this. That would The exact recovery would be in the case of zero noise. So we, we of course can't reach that in, in reality, but we can get very close. Um, and so what we find looking at this plot is that that 550-ish samples gives you a very good estimate. And it's also right at about the point where you see diminishing returns from adding more samples. So uh, of course, this isn't, this isn't a concrete uh, result that we exactly recovered it, but I think this shows that we can use these, these models and these estimates uh, to give us general guidelines about, about how many measurements we need. And so that, that's a really exciting result. And, I think it'd be useful for experimental design in the future. And we, we showed this for a few other uh, empirical fitness functions as well. Um, so that's just to wrap up that this one arc of the talk, um, just to uh, highlight the main messages again, uh, we have these compressed sensing uh, theory that can provide scaling laws for the number of measurements exactly to require GNK, recover GNK fitness functions. Uh, and then the structure informed GNK models are uh, relatively predictive of the number of measurements required to estimate empirical fitness function. So it's great that that worked well with uh, GFP, but do you expect the random field model to change as a function of the protein or protein family you're interested in? Yeah, that's a great question um, that I'm happy to highlight as a limitation of this. Uh, so I think there's, there's really three limitations that I see of this work that I think would be really great um, uh, avenues for future work. So uh, and, and that's one of them. I think this, this hypothesis that structural contacts can be predictive of epistatic interactions may be true in certain cases, but uh, I think it's is, is unlikely to be true in every case. Uh, for instance, proteins that undergo conformational changes uh, before, they, before they perform their function, uh, you wouldn't know that from, say, a static crystal structure. Uh, the, the other big limitation that I see is that uh, it's unclear how the very unique and complicated noise in uh, NGS-driven high throughput assays interacts with the CS guarantees, the compressed sensing guarantees. Um, those guarantees often involve Gaussian noise, um, but these assays have very complicated noise. Um, and the other limitation is, is just that uh, it doesn't apply to the common case of edit distance balls, which I think is a really interesting avenue for future. Um, there was a question in the uh, chat about uh, why is the uh, estimate always uh, optimistic? Um, Overestimating them. Yeah, in your empirical to prediction comparison, there's uh, sort of errors above the diagonal, but never below it. Uh, is that related to the roughness of the empirical landscape? Um, sorry, I'm trying to go back, but I'm having I'm struggling. Um, in the scatter plot, where they the inset? Correct. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not aware that it was always over predicting. Oh, oh. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't have a good answer for that specific. We, we did train 50 models on 50 different random uh, subsets of training data, and that may be an artifact of one of their particular training sets. Uh, it's it's not clear to me exactly why that why that's true. Um, so that wraps up this uh, this first part of the talk, uh, and now I want to move on to this other project that that was really driven by Amarali, and I was very grateful to be a part of, uh, which is a very separate way that we can use the Walsh Hadamard transform. Uh, and in particular, we're now going to use it in a different way, and we're going to use it to regularize neural networks. And so in order to do that, we need to shift our perspective slightly from what we were doing in the previous part of the talk. And so just as a reminder, uh, and this may seem obvious, but any a fitness function is any function mapping a sequence space to scalars. It doesn't need to be natural or simulated. It's just any function that does this. Uh, and every one of those functions has an associated walsh hadamard or Fourier transform. So, so far we've talked about two, two types of fitness functions that have associated walsh hadamard 
uh, transforms. We've seen empirical fitness functions and we've seen simulated fitness functions. But one that we haven't talked about is that models trained on fitness data have their own transform that's distinct from the transform of the fitness data that they're trained on. And so that's, that's really gonna be the focus of this part. Uh, so just to continue on this, this perspective shift, uh, in the previous part of the talk, we, we talked about models where the models, the parameters of the models were actually the coefficients of the Fourier transform themselves. And that's what we were doing when we were fitting these lasso models. Uh, so just in this cartoon, we were essentially uh, feeding the fitness data directly into the Fourier transform, and that was producing our estimated fitness function. Now we're going to consider a different perspective where we're going to fit a neural network to the data, and then we're going to apply the Fourier transform to the model rather than to the data itself. And so the cartoon looks more like this, where you have fitness data, you pass it into the neural network, and then you take the Fourier transform of the neural network, use that information to change the training of the neural network, and then the neural network becomes your estimated fitness function. So just to make this a bit more mathematical, uh, in the previous part of the talk, we were fitting, we were uh, using this lasso method to, to fit models of fitness functions, uh, where we have this mean squared term uh, between the observed fitness and the model predictions, and then we have this L1 term um, that encourages sparsity and is important for, for compressed sensing. So in this part of the talk, we're going to be talking about a different uh, style of method where we have this model G theta, and that is what we're making predictions on. Uh, so you see the mean squared is now between the observed fitness values and the model predictions out of the neural network. And then we're gonna add this regularization term. And that regularization term is gonna be a function of the Fourier coefficients of the model. And so how we calculate those is by uh, multiplying the Fourier matrix, is by taking the inverse Fourier matrix of the vector of all possible predictions from the model uh, for every sequence in the sequence space. And so just as a quick review of, of why we do regularization, uh, regularization is a very common technique in training, in training neural networks. And the main reason that we do this is because uh, neural networks have a tendency to overfit. Uh, they tend to uh, essentially try to memorize the data if you, if you train them for too long. And this, this leads to unrealistic uh, estimated fitness functions in the fitness function case uh, that don't generalize well outside of their training data. And so regularization is essentially a general way of uh, encouraging the model to act how we might want it to act. So we're gonna in input some inductive bias or a priori information uh, about, our, about what we want from the model uh, in order to, to change its training and encourage it to behave correctly. Uh, and so if any, for people familiar with training neural networks, you are probably most familiar with regularizing the parameters of the model itself. Uh, this data in various ways. The, the two main ways that, that are done are L2 regularization, where you minimize the L2 norm of the parameters, or L1, where you minimize the L1 norm. Of the but the key idea of this, of uh, the methods I'm talking about here, is that we're going to instead regularize the Fourier coefficients of the model instead of the parameters themselves. And the reason we're going to do that is because the Fourier coefficients uh, allow us to impart uh, intuition about epistatic interactions onto the model. So uh, these Fourier coefficients uh, correspond to the epi epistatic interactions that the model implicitly represents. So the model is a big black box neural network, but in that it implicitly represents a number of interactions. And these can be calculated by calculating the Fourier coefficients of the model. And so then we can ask what behavior might we want to encourage in these implicit interactions. And I think at this point in our talks, it's probably no surprise that we're gonna encourage a specific type of behavior. In particular, we know that many realistic fitness functions tend to be sparse in these in epistatic interactions. And so that's really the behavior that we're gonna to wanna to encourage in our model, that the implicit interactions that it represents are sparse. And so it's actually quite simple uh, how we're going to do that. Our regularization term is simply going to be the L1 norm of the, uh, uh, epistatic interactions of these coefficients. Might you consider penalizing the higher order interactions more related to the kind of power law decay that was mentioned in the first talk? 
Yeah, I think that's a, a, an interesting question and an interesting avenue for research, uh, but uh, we haven't tried. Right. Uh, can you talk a bit about how you, I guess you have to sample to the coefficients to um, regularize them. So you can yes, I, I, will, I will talk about that. So. Um, so, so now we have this complete loss function that we use to train networks. We have the mean squared error term and then the uh, term that encourages sparsity in the epistatic interactions. And so uh, I just want to be very concrete about the procedure of this process because it will be important for how we how we change it in the future. Uh, so the first first step is just to calculate the MSE term when you calculate this loss, which is on the actual observed empirical fitness data. And then you go through this process where you take every sequence in the sequence space, uh, regardless of whether it has real observed data or not. You pass it into your neural network to collect this vector of all possible fitness values. And so this is the fitness landscape represented by the neural network. And then you calculate the inverse Fourier transform to get your Fourier coefficients. And then you apply the L1 regularization. All right. So, sorry, I wanted to ask this a uh, few slides back, but I'm just going to ask it now. What is the motivation for bringing in the neural net at all if you have a, a much more specific and less black boxy approach that kind of also works? What, what, what motivated you to, to, besides the fact that everybody uses neural nets? Yeah, well, I think that's that's part of the motivation. Neural networks are very powerful in many ways. They, uh, you know, they're very they're one quite easy to train. They're easy to use. Uh, and they can impart other inductive biases that you might want to on on your space of sequences, uh, and you can still then also add this other inductive bias and uh, imparting that kind of other techniques. You know, for instance, convolutions and, and things like that would be difficult in the uh, pure, uh, say, sparse coding theory uh, kind of model. Mm -hmm. So, so we described the, the basic process of epistatic net regularization, uh, which is what it's called, uh, and then tested it on these four canonical bacterial fitness landscapes. Uh, and the parameters of these landscapes are shown here. Uh, they're all binary fitness functions of size five or six, and these are complete. These are combinatorially complete landscapes. And so the quite exciting result is that if you randomly sample uh, 20 training sets uh, from each of these, and then uh, use them to train, train a number of competing models. Uh, the two main ones you want to look at are the uh, DNN plus epistatic net uh, in blue and the regular DNN. Uh, you, you, we see consistently and significantly improved performance uh, in all of these cases. Uh, so the regularization, the inductive bias induced by the regularization is helpful in this case. So the important thing to look at uh, here is that these are very small fitness functions. And so it's very easy to do this exact epistatic net regularization. So at each step of our iterative optimization to, uh, to train neural networks, we have to make Q to the L neural network predictions in this epistatic net uh, framework. Uh, and in this case, that's quite easy. It's only 32 total or 64 total uh, sequences. But of course, that's not true for many uh, fitness functions of practical value. Uh, Q to the L can be e extremely large, uh, as we've talked about before. And each step of this ap exact epistatic net would involve also uh, multiplying by the gigantic Fourier transform matrix. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much about them because Amarelli has already talked a lot about these, but uh, we can actually scale this up using the sparse coding techniques that, that Amarelli has talked about before. So instead of using calculating every uh, making a prediction for every possible sequence in the space, uh, you only need to randomly sample uh, k log squared times the size of the space uh, or log squared of the size of the space uh, sequence, where k is the sparsity of the model's implicit epistatic interaction. Uh, and so just to show uh, how these two things scale, obviously it's, it's much, much slower uh, if you change the size of the sequence space uh, to scale the scalable epistatic net. And so uh, this will actually allow us to apply this technique to much, much larger uh, sequence spaces. And so just to compare these two, the procedures, uh, just to be concrete, uh, in the exact epistatic net we talked about before, you're calculating, making predictions for every sequence in the space. 
And then in the scalable epistatic net, instead you're selecting uh, a set of random sequences. Uh, and then you are making predictions on those random sequences. And you're applying uh, the sparse graph coding techniques uh, to get an approximate set of Fourier filters. The first thing I want to highlight about this result is just sort of that it's possible that you can calculate the Fourier coefficients despite the size of the sequence space. Uh, you know, this plot is just showing the first order coefficients uh, using 5 million predictions from random sequences. Uh, so instead of having to calculate all 10 to the 71 predictions, uh, you can take 5 million and you can use these scalable processes, the scalable algorithms uh, in order to calculate the Fourier coefficients. And you calculate all the Fourier coefficients. Not just the first order. Um, and then I think a, a very reasonable question is, well, does this depend on the sampling of the sequences that you take? Uh, and the answer is largely no. Uh, if you take two completely independent sets of 5 million sequences and calculate the, the Walsh-Hadamard coefficients corresponding to their, their predictions, then you, you get almost perfect correlation. Uh, there's a question in the chat that uh, the actual mutations at a position could be more than binary. How do we model that? Uh, and I'm, go I'm going to mention that in, in a second um, after I finish talking about this. Result. So just very quickly, um, I think the, the real thing everyone is interested in is does this actually improve the power of your neural network? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you use these scalable epistatic net inter uh, regularization, then you do see significantly improved performance over a regular DNA on this uh, GFP data set, uh, which is a canonical data set that many people work on. So this is, this is quite an exciting result. Uh, I believe th those are random, uh, yeah, random. Um, so uh, just to wrap up this part of the talk, um, you know, we, we talked about that regularizing neural networks so that they represent a sparse set of epistatic interactions uh, improves predictive performance. And then we can use sparse graph coding algorithms to scale this up to extremely large uh, fitness functions. So there is one major limitation if you read the paper uh, that was mentioned in the chat, which is that uh, the scalable epistatic net uh, methods can only be applied to fitness functions of binary sequences. Uh, but I just want to highlight uh, some of Amirali's more recent work, which he he mentioned, uh, which is that this this problem has actually been solved, and you can you can now uh, use these scalable techniques uh, for functions of any size alpha. Uh, so now I just want to talk briefly about uh, a very recent piece of work that I've been doing with some colleagues at at Dino that also uses. Uh, the walsh hadamard transform uh, in a slightly different way. And is uh, details of this are available in a preprint that we just put up last week. So this, the main part of this, uh, or part, main question in this talk is it concerns global epistasis. Uh, and so global epistasis is a slightly different effect than local epistasis. Uh, global epistasis describes how uh, the effect of a mutation can be change depending on the current fitness of a sequence or the background fitness of the sequence. And this is in contrast to local epistasis, which is what we've been talking about so far, which refers to interactions between specific positions in a sequence. So I think global epistasis is easiest to see in, a, in, in an example. So imagine we have two sequences uh, with a, a two separate fitnesses, and we make the same mutation to those two sequences. Uh, let's say we move an alanine to a valine at the 30th position. Uh, and just to be clear, this fitness function uh, has no interactions. It only has first order terms. Uh, so it's just an example. Uh, so without global epistasis, uh, the effect of this mutation is exactly the same. It doesn't matter the background. With global epistasis, what, it, what changes is that the background actually does matter. Uh, and so, and this is in a way that isn't, uh, isn't connected to any specific interactions. It's a global effect. And so in this case, the uh, effect of this mutation on a sequence that has lower fitness is much higher 
than one that has higher fitness. And this is a very common pattern observed in global epistasis, which is called diminishing return. Uh, so how is global epistasis represented mathematically? Uh, it's in an expression like this, where we have a uh, latent fitness function f, uh, which we'll assume to be sparse. Uh, and that, oh no, um, that is transformed by a monotonically increasing nonlinearity uh, to produce observed fitness values without noise in this case. Um, there may be noise added, but. Uh, so just to see what this looks like, um, it, it, on the uh, hor horizontal axis here, we have this uh, latent fitness function. In this case, it's called the additive trait uh, in this paper uh, by my colleague, Jakob Poklanowski. And on the vertical axis is the observed fitness values. And you can see how there's this monotonically increasing transformation uh, that converts one from the other. Um, so I can see how this has the global epistasis property. Is it general in the sense that anything uh, that you can think of can be, that you can transform it away? If you like, that there's an H inverse in general that, that can get it back to the sparse representation? Um, I'm not sure I understand I'm, the question. Um, I'm not sure. I'll think about it more and bring it up in the discussion. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so just like, all other fitness functions, the observed fitness fitness function y has an associated walsh hadamard or Fourier uh, transform and coefficients, which we'll call beta y in this case. And, and the main question that, that we asked uh, when we were looking at this is how do the Fourier coefficients of y, the observed uh, after the transformation by the, by the nonlinearity compare to those of the uh, latent fitness function? And so the main intuition is that this nonlinearity must be represented somehow in the Fourier uh, transform. And the way it's represented are by spurious epistatic interactions uh, or spurious coefficients in the Fourier transform of Y. So just to make this very concrete, uh, there's an example here where on the left, we're comparing a latent fitness function F to its observed uh, corresponding observed fitness function after being transformed by this exponential function, which is just a model function. Um, it, it sort of exaggerates the effects of global epistasis. It's not necessarily realistic, but uh, what we see is that the Fourier coefficients of the uh, latent fitness function, which we'll call beta in green are sparse because we designed them that way. Uh, and then when you transform this, uh, you end up with a much denser set of coefficients. So you see a number of higher order coefficients appearing that did not appear in the sparse latent function. And so these are what we're referring to when we're talking about spurious coefficients. Um, can you give some intuition, I guess, related to Alex's question about um, the monotonicity of the nonlinearity? Um, like, like why would we have that? As a, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. It, I think the monotonicity comes from a kind of a modeling assumption because if you don't have a monotonic transformation, then it's not clear what the latent fitness function necessarily means. And so it, it's something of a modeling assumption that it's monotonic. Um, there, there are papers that show that a global epistasis in general is not a uh, only a modeling choice. It's actually a result of physical dynamics and uh, the measurement process, but those don't always assume, uh, don't always show it's monotonic. They just show that there is a non-linear transformation. Uh, so the, the way that I've come to think about global epistasis is that it's almost like noise. It, it corrupts a fitness function in a certain way. If you, if you have a sparse fitness function and global epistasis is applied to it, then you might observe it and it doesn't look sparse to you. It looks, you know, not to say, but it looks a little bit noisy and like that's a dense epistatic representation, but these are just spurious. Uh, and so a lot of this project was, was asking, how, can we remove this corruption in some way? Uh, but but first to understand a little bit more concretely and also to use the walsh hadamard transform a little bit more concretely, uh, you know, this intuition that uh, that the observed data will have a denser epistatic representation than the latent fitness function can actually be understood in terms of an ep, uh, uncertainty principle. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with uncertainty principles, uh, they say that a function can't be simultaneously concentrated uh, in two 
different representations. Um, so uh, the, the common one is in the Fourier case uh, in the, of continuous signals, a function can't be concentrated in a, in a small region of time and in a small region of frequency space. And so one of the nice things about uh, the uh, walsh hadamard transform being an orthogonal transformation is that we actually get some uncertainty principles for free. They uh, are available for any orthogonal transformation like this. And so this is what it looks like in the fitness function case. Uh, this is an entropic uncertainty principle. There's other types of uncertainty principles, but entropy is a measure of the concentration of a vector on, a, on its elements. Uh, low entropy, indicates that uh, a vector is very concentrated on a small number of elements. High entropy indicates it's spread out over many uh, different positions. Uh, and so the sum of the entropy of the uh, fitness function and its epistatic coefficients uh, must be greater than a constant. And this is the definition of the uh, uncertainty principle. And so all that says is that if the entropy of the fitness function goes down in the fitness domain, then the entropy of the epistatic coefficients must go up necessarily in order to satisfy this, this bound. So if you concentrate a fitness function in fitness space, uh, then it becomes more spread out in epistatic. So that's exactly what we're observing here in this example. We are concentrating the fitness function on a small number of values. Uh, all the high fitness is now assigned to a small number of values in the, uh, on the left in the fitness space. And then we see increased density in uh, the epistatic space. And so this is important because as we talked about in the first arc of this talk, uh, the sparsity or the density uh, conversely of the epistatic coefficients determines the number of measurements that are required to estimate uh, the fitness function. So essentially what is happening here is that if the density in beta goes up, the entropy goes up, then we will require more measurements to estimate this function using the techniques that we talked about earlier. Uh, and so the implication of that is that global epistasis uh, may have the effect of increasing the number of measurements that are required. And so we tested this, this hypothesis uh, by taking a number of uh, actually GNK fitness functions, the sample GNK fitness functions applied uh, increasingly extreme nonlinearities to them uh, uh, some exponential, some sigmoidal, and uh, cubic uh, monotonic transformations, and then compared the, um, and using, and this was all using a fixed number of training points, uh, which was one fourth of the total size of the sequence space. And then the, on the vertical axis here is the uh, Spearman correlation on the test set uh, between predictions from these models uh, trained on this, on this data. And on the horizontal axis is the entropy of the epistatic interactions in the uh, of the transformed fitness function. Uh, and so what you see is that indeed at a fixed training set size, model performance degrades as the entropy uh, of the epistatic interactions goes up, which is what we would expect uh, from our, our earlier discussions about, uh, you know, this, this indicates that we would need more data when the entropy is higher. So the important thing to recognize about this uh, is that all of the models that we've talked about so far uh, today and all of the models in the plot so far have trained as the first term is this uh, mean squared error between the data and the model predictions. And so uh, in this, we started to ask, uh, can we change that in some way? Are there other loss functions that might be more robust to these monotonic transformations? Uh, and so our hypothesis was that a, a different type of loss function known as a ranking loss or a contrastive loss uh, would be robust to this. Uh, and these, and the, the reason is that these loss functions are designed only to rank sequences correctly in a fitness function. Uh, they don't actually use any of the information about the raw values of the fitness. Uh, they only consider the uh, pairwise differences between predictions and, and try to force those to be ranked correctly. Uh, and so therefore, if I make a monotonic transformation of data and give it to a, this type of loss function, it actually doesn't change the, uh, the way that the, the model is trained. Uh, and so when we perform the same test using uh, this loss, which is called the Bradley-Terry loss, uh, we actually do see that uh, on all of these, these training sets and all of these examples, uh, the, the models are more robust to the effects of global epistasis, to the corruption by global epistasis. Uh, so, so that's quite exciting. Um, 
And so just as, as one last piece of information about this, uh, we go back to this example. And so the reason that we think this uh, works is because these contrastive losses seem to be particularly good at uh, recovering the, what I'm calling the hidden sparsity uh, from data that's been, or fitness functions that have been corrupted by gold level stasis. So we've seen this example already a number of times. We have a sparse fitness function F that is transformed by global level stasis to produce a dense observed fitness function Y. And now we're gonna add one more uh, layer to this, which is we're gonna fit to this dense uh, observed fitness function, uh, a neural network trained with a contrastive loss. And what we're gonna find is actually this recovers the sparse, uh, the original sparse latent fitness function, uh, almost perfectly. Uh, so on the left is our comparisons between the latent fitness function F and the uh, models, uh, the trained fitness function F hat, and the correlation is nearly perfect as, as are the uh, epistatic coefficients of, of that model. And then just as one final little bit, uh, uh, these contrastive losses also show uh, improved performance on many benchmark tasks from the flip protein engineering benchmark. Uh, so I think these are, are a really exciting practical tool for, for overcoming uh, corruption by global epistasis. Uh, so just to, to wrap this section up, um, global epistasis causes dense epistatic representations, uh, which then requires more data in order to learn fitness functions. And these contrastive losses are robust, more robust than MSC, the corrupting effect of global epistasis. Um, so that's, that's it for, for my talk. I just want to uh, have some acknowledgments, uh, of course, to Amarali, as well as uh, my PhD advisor, Jennifer, and my colleagues at Dino, Sam, and Jakob, as well as uh, my many wonderful collaborators from the Berkeley AI Research Lab. Uh, 